questions. Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, at the outset, my sincere thanks to Bhanoti for including, including me in this course. Okay, uh, I have no financial interest to disclose. We all know that there are two OCT platforms have been developed, time domain and spectral domain. That is Fourier domain also. Time domain OCT instrumentation utilizes a movable reference mirror. The mirror moves for each a scan to determine the ocular structures, depth, thereby limiting the speed of which the image is acquired. In spectral domain OCT has a fixed reference mirror to measure the depth of the information and uses a Fourier transformation algorithm. And that way the spectral interferogram to produce the a scan which results in faster acquisition and better image quality. So uh, there are some machines are dedicated for entry segments, some machines are both anterior as well as posterior. And uh, these uh, choices of the OCT systems, the market currently has a few choices of spectral domain OCT systems with both posterior and anterior segment imaging capabilities. The RT view and I view, that is Opto view, as well as the CIRAS that Caljas Meditech acquire approximately 26,000 scans per second, while the Spectralis, that is Heidelberg, uh, obtains 40,000 scans per second. Each of the spectral domain OCTs have a wavelength of 80 to 820 to 879 nanometer. While the Vicente is slower, it is that is time domain OCT, it's longer wavelength, that is 1310 nanometer, penetrates deep through the turbid structures, thereby visualizing the entry chamber in more detail. And each design has its own ad advantages and clinical applications can assist in determining the better choice. So these are the systems available in the market now. And recently there is a ultra high resolution OCT which is capable of XCL resolution of 1 to 4 micron with scan width of 5 to 12 millimeter. Development of ultra high resolution OCT enables the precise imaging of the individual corneal and conjunctival layers, tear film and meniscus and contact lens interfaces. So UHR OCT can also be used to differentiate among various corneal and ocular surface pathologies, including ocular surface squamous neoplasia, lymphoma, pterygia, melanosis, and Salzman nodule degeneration. So now I will be going on this clinical oriented practice now. So and the, the anti-segment OCT plays an important role in visualizing the extent of infiltrates and depth of the ulceration of infectious keratitis in hesychronias. This is the patient who had uh, this uh, thorn injury and this initially this uh, patient had this KOH positive for fungal filaments and now this patient, uh, this infiltrate was healed but there was still now you can see that in anti-segment OCT this, uh, this dense exudates in the deposromal layer. So that patient needed ultimately intrastromal injection of the amputation B and then it became better. Another patient, this patient who was empirically treated by uh, this antimicrobials and ultimately was not healing and came to me after three weeks and then on OCT I could see that there is dense large keratic precipitates and which gives the clue to diagnosis of HSB stromal keratitis. You can see this in ASOCT only you can see they appreciate this the scapids and the sequential asocytic scans provide the monitoring of the size and depth of the ulcer, the depth of infiltrates, areas of thinning, amount of endothelial exudates and changing the therapy in cases of no response. That patient who had this scapids and after putting these antivirals, this scapids gone out and now the patient became better. So another patient, this patient, uh, this ASOCT in monitoring the response to therapy, that is, this patient who had PK uh, seven months ago, therapeutic PK for coronal ulcer. It was done by one of my fellow. Then after this patient, he, she never developed uh, this uh, clear graft and then sutures became loose and we removed all the sutures at three months to four months. And then again, this patient developed some infiltrate in the graft. So we did this. Uh, anterior segment OCT. Before that, this clinically you can see that there is double anterior chamber and there is a cleft in the anterior chamber which is prominent superiorly. So this a hyperreflective structure traverses anterior chamber uh, that is one side from one side to another side. You can see this is this hyperreflective membrane. So there is also the one site of attachment to the donor area. This is the attachment, of attachment site. And what is the diagnosis now? Can anybody tell this? What could be the diagnosis in this case? This patient had this infiltrate area here uh, in this area and now on ASOCT you can see this is this, uh, this is the, this hyperreflective area. So the diagnosis was uh, retained dismissed membrane and it can be due to incomplete refinition or loose attachment of the dismissed membrane. So this patient again underwent repeat therapeutic uh, keratoplasty and in that cases we should remember that we have to move this retained dismissed membrane. 
another case so this patient had this uh, desmetrosil following this uh, uh, this was a case of this corneal melt in cases of dry, dry eye patients and this amniotic membrane grafting was done and then this patient at this initial visit and after this amniotic membrane grafting this patient became better now so depth of this corneal scar so this is the apparently it looks like that it is a full thing uh, this very superficial scar and SOCT plays an important role to visualize the depth of the corneal opacities and that is a zone of hyperreflective area and that way it, 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 that means it tells us whether we have to go for lamellar or full thickness cranial cluster. In this case, even though it looks like a very superficial scar but it was involving the whole thickness of the corneal area and that way patient needed this full thickness cranial cluster here. So this is another patient. Um, this patient was 65 years male who had gradual immunosuppression for two years. Nothing significant with first history and patient was referred from the general ophthalmologist for PK plus IOL. So this is the, this, and on anterior segment to CT, we could see that there is a dense subepithelial lesion and underlying this cornea is perfectly clear. So dense subepithelial lesion consistent with subepithelial corneal scar and a diagnosis of epithel, uh, this epithelial hypertrophy was made. And this patient ultimately underwent just epithelial debridement along with diamond bar polish and this patient didn't need any sort of corneal grafting. So you can see that this, this underlying cornea is perfectly healthy. But from apparently it looks like that this patient needed a DPK plus IOL. So another patient, this patient was, that means uh, 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 diagnosed by a case, as a case of OSSN because of these feeder vessels. We can see it here. These feeder vessels and with this uh, corneal mass and this patient, um, when I took the history, patient underwent uh, cataract surgery one year ago and patient had a dislocated intraocular lens and one haptic of the IOL was touching the cornea. And ultimately this uh, led to localized PBK with epithelial hypertrophy. So when I took this, uh, this ASOCT, I could see that then subepithelial lesion consistent with subepithelial corneal scar and that this underlying cornea is perfectly healthy and then it was just I did this uh, corneal uh, that means epithelial debridement and then repositioning of the IOL. So this is the picture I took because this ultra in ultra high resolution OCT this is a 77 year old male with a history of corneal scarring was referred due to concern of OSSN and on clinical examination revealed a white elevated papillary lesion of the cornea with a prominent feeder vessel. So ultra high resolution OCT revealed a thin, normal hyperreflective epithelium and a dense subepithelial lesion and the underlying cornea was perfectly healthy. This is the underlying cornea and this is the subepithelial lesion. So this is consistent with subepithelial corneal scar uh, which may be a ring or lipid and there was no evidence of OSSN. So same way we can go for ultra high resolution OCT in cases of pterygium where this we can see that this uh, uh, epithelial layer and then subepithelial just thick and hyperreflective subepithelial tissue here and the underlying cornea is perfectly healthy. So in corneal transplantation in PK alignment of the donor host corneal and the depth of the sutures can be properly identified by OCT. This is a patient where we can see that this graft junction is quite um, well opposed. This is there is a gap, there is a strip formation and here there is protrusion. So being PK with femtosecond lasers, we can see that there is mushrooming of the this top left pattern or mushroom zigzag shape, we can appreciate it in patient OCT. This is the patient uh, for endothelial keratoplasty who underwent endothelial keratoplasty and ACCT provides visualization of the attachment of the graft to the host bed, graft thickness, interface abnormalities, graft dislocation, graft host junction and approximation of the graft. Here we can see that there is a fluid cleft and this graft is dislocated and here this is the site of uh, this, this is the site of incision and the graft is perfectly attached, there is no cleft, anything like that. So ASOCT in DMEC, this is the patient with one week post of period and then there was this corneal was hedge and only in ASOCT we could find that there is slight detachment, we can appreciate it here only. This is the site of displacement detachment and ultimately when we did this uh, rebubbling, we can find that this displacement is attached here. 
So dismemberment detachment is not an uncommon complication after intraocular surgery, and ASOCT plays an important role in finding the location and extent of dismemberment detachment, especially in cloudy corneas, and deciding the appropriate management of the CM. This patient who had large uh, dismemberment detachment, and this separation was quite high, and so we thought to go for uh, this bubbling, and. We put this C3 fatic acid injection, and in these cases, we expected that there may be some trapped viscous fluid, or it may be some sort of viscoelastics, and we just give some uh, printing incision to drain out the fluid. This is after two weeks post op, four weeks post op. So, efficacy of intraoperative ACCT during this A handheld OCT is useful to detect the interface fluid between the host cornea and the graft during this And it was first reported by Akio Miyakoshi. And this is just like a handheld OCT, and it is spectral domain I view 100. And here we can see that uh, this, there is some dislocation of some fluid space, and again we have to go for rebubbling and then we can also uh, just uh, attach the graft. Same way we can go for this intraoperative ACCT during DALC also so to see that residual uh, any stromal bed thickness all those things or residual uh, that means any sort of retained posterior stroma we can detect. So ACCT in keratoconus high resolution ACCT that means is useful tool in delineating the corneal structures. The resolution of RT view OCT is 5 micron. Hence it you can uh, it can help in characterizing and monitoring the various corneal pathologies. Just skipping it. And in ACCT in keratoconus various morphologies of dismet membrane which is seen whether this patient needs any sort of uh, dial or PK we can that means uh, guide as per the dismet uh, regularity. So the limitations of ACCT is that since the posterior layer of the iris pigment epithelium is not transparent for infrared light, the posterior chamber is not visualized in the most cases. The infrared light is absorbed on its way through the sclera and so entire thickness of the sclera is not visible. Sulcus to sulcus diameter critical for phacic IOL measurement cannot be performed by ACCT. Angle closure due to anteriorly placed ciliary body, plateau iris or any other causes related to ciliary body swelling cannot be imaged. And pre of evaluation in eyes with traumatic cataracts, should expiration, subluxated lenses to identify amount of junior, junior dialysis cannot be possible in, by ACCT. So to conclude, use of ACCT has allowed for better and more efficient diagnosis, improved disease monitoring, enhanced surgical planning, and superior monitoring of the response to treatment. Future OCT technology includes imaging of the microscopic structures and those really located posterior to the iris. And achieving this result can someday result in biopsy-like images of the coronal pathologies, including protozoa and fungi. Future swift source model with a longer wavelength allowing better penetrance of anterior segment tissue morphology may also enhance the role of OCT imaging on the eye care professional.